Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on today's webinar from Smith School of Business at Queen's University. My name is Bertrand Malch, and I am an accounting professor at Smith. I will be your host for today's event. To begin, I want to acknowledge that Queen's is situated on traditional Anishina Bay and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar, Accounting Standards in a Dynamic Environment, on behalf of Smith's Business Insight and the CPA Ontario Centre for Corporate Reporting and Professionalism. The centre was established at Smith thanks to the generous support of CPA Ontario. Accounting standards play a crucial role in the economy, contributing to transparency and clarity in the way companies communicate their financial information. However, the rapid pace of economic and social change poses interpretation and application problems for preparers and users of financial information, as the production of standards often lags behind these transformations. It is therefore essential to better understand how to apply standards in such a dynamic environment and what resources can be used to stay on top of standards interpretation. So there is a lot to understand here, and we have an amazing panel and moderator today to help us along. Let me first introduce your moderator for today. Dominique Amel is a principal at the Accounting Standards Board. Dominique works to develop and transform accounting standards to meet society's evolving needs. Dominique has over 10 years of experience in the financial services industry, most recently as part of the corporate finance team at Intact Financial Corporation. At Intact, she specialized in complex accounting and participated in several acquisitions as well as the implementation of accounting standards, such as IFRS 15 and IFRS 16. She has also worked in audit at National Bank and KPMG. Dominique will be joined by a very experienced panel. Orman Capisciolto is chair of the Accounting Standards Board. Orman has served on the ACSB since 2015, including as a member, vice chair, and now chair. He also chaired the ACSB's Private Enterprise Advisory Committee and membership on the IFRS Accounting Standards Discussion Group. Orman's work in standard setting goes beyond the private sector, including past roles with the Public Sector Accounting Discussion Group and the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board's Internal Control over Financial Reporting Task Force. On top of his standard setting experience, Orman was the National Accounting Standards Partner with BDO Canada LLP, where he has spent much of his career. Fiona Bentham is the Director of Corporate Accounting and Accounting Policy at TELUS Corporation. Fiona has over 25 years of industry experience at TELUS. She directly leads the team that is committed to ensuring the accuracy and integrity of the financial statements through their involvement in complex accounting transactions, in addition to leading the internal accounting CPD offerings and the development, implementation, and oversight of general accounting and financial policies to support the best in class corporate financial reporting. Fiona is engaged in the CPA Canada Sustainability Preparers Working Group and participated in ACSB ISB outreach projects. Finally, Chris Kowalczyk is a portfolio manager at Claret Asset Management and a member of the Accounting Standards Board. Claret is an independent portfolio management firm that manages 2.4 billion in assets, and Chris is dedicated to the investment management of private accounts for high net worth individuals, families, trusts, corporations, and not profit and non-profit foundations. Chris is involved in the firm's independent fundamental research process. He has a keen interest in how changes to accounting standards can impact a company's financial results, management discussion, disclosures, and key performance indicators. As you can hear from these profiles, we are in very good hands today. After today's presentations, we will have time for a Q&A with our panelists. I encourage you to, to ask questions. You can write them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time during the webinar. And I do encourage you to ask questions. The chat feature will also be open today so you can converse with one another there. But for your questions to the panel, please only use the Q&A button. I also want to remind you that this session will be recorded and that just by being signed up today, you will automatically receive a link to the recording. You will receive it by email in a couple of days. Now I will turn things over to Dominic to start the discussion. Dominic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bertrand. So as a way to kick off the discussion, I wanted to ask you, what is the financial reporting issue that is currently on your mind, but that you were not thinking about, let's say, a year ago? Uh, so Chris, as a user of financial statements, maybe we could start with you. 
Yeah, for sure. So I, I wouldn't say it's a financial reporting issue, but companies are really good at finding ways to become either more, show that they're more efficient or they have a stronger operating performance. And like examples everyone knows are operating versus financing leases where the operating lease made them seem way more capital efficient. But one of the most interesting transactions I've seen specifically over the last year is the inclusion of carbon credits on the balance sheet. So a carbon credit for those who might not know is basically represents one ton of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas equivalent as either reduced or avo uh, avoided or removed from the atmosphere. And there's kind of two types of markets for carbon credits. There's compliance, cre compliance credits where an entity is required by law to have these credits to meet different contractual obligations or the voluntary system. And I think everyone's familiar with the voluntary system where a company's going to start using the carbon credits because they've made a net zero commitment and they have to fulfill it. So here's where it gets interesting. If you think about Canada, we have a lot of really big natural resource areas and we have a lot of timber. Now, these companies that are involved in sort of a timber trade could actually be generators of a carbon credit. And so you'll see these timber companies basically go out and they'll start allocating some of their land with the trees on it to part of a forest conservation easement project. And this is where it gets fun on the financial reporting transaction side. So these companies now actually get to gener uh, recognize an asset on their balance sheet. And at times it can be really substantial and it leads to a big change in their book value. So one specific example is there's a Canadian company that used a $40,000 transaction to justify a $14 million asset on their balance sheet. And that might not sound like much, but that corresponded to a 5% growth in their book value. And so as a user, you sort of sit there and you ask yourself, does this seem reasonable? Does this make sense? And so carbon credits are, it's really new, it's exciting, and it's something that I definitely wasn't even thinking about a year ago. Thank you, Chris. Very interesting. Fiona, you're responsible for preparing the financial statements of TELUS. So as a preparer, what's your take on this? Well, you know, um, we have a similar scenario in, in TELUS. We've recently um, gotten involved in VPPAs and their associated RACs. A VPPA is a virtual power purchase agreement entered into by a company such as TELUS and a developer to build renewable energy projects such as wind and solar farms. And the agreement contains a contract for differences arrangement, which it contains a strike price per megawatt hour produced and essentially locks in the return for the developer. And it's a hedge for us, the company, on future electricity prices. Then as the wind and or solar farm produces energy and sends it to the electrical grid, they then receive the pool price as payment for producing energy. And then they immediately turn around and settle with us, the company, and the difference between the pool price and the strike price is settled in cash. But there's no physical actual delivery of energy from the farm direct to, to the company. And the arrangement, is, and as a result of that, that's why it's called virtual power purchase arrangement. Um, and as well, you know, if you think about it, a solar farm is going to produce an awful lot of energy at peak hours during the day when it's very sunny. And when they're doing that, you're not necessarily consuming more energy at that time. So if you were thinking about hedge accounting, you're not going to get your one for one match. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting, actually. They actually track the metered production by minute for solar farms, mm -hmm. similarly with wind farms. As a result, you know, we'll, we'll reach a point where the company, we, we can't claim an own use exemption and we can't match one for one. So we can't hedge this item, which results in the value of the forward looking element. And these agreements are 30 years, sometimes longer, ending up as a derivative asset on the balance sheet. And then you mark to market it and, um, through your P&L. It actually impacts net income instead of OCI like other hedges. And so on. And, and then on top of this, to make it more complex, that strike price, it actually includes the value of the associated REC that must be carved out. And a REC is a renewable energy certificate. And it what it does is it's a certificate that is for each megawatt hour of electricity generated from a new renewable source, such as a solar farm or a wind farm. And these racks can be used to offset emission targets or they can be sold in an open market. So interesting times. Yeah, and definitely not straightforward. Thanks for that. Armin, you're the center setter in the group. Um, yeah, yeah no, um, 
I really enjoyed Chris and Fiona's answers. Uh, it, it, I'm thinking about both of those things as well, car or all three of those things with the recs and their uh, carbon credits. We're actually doing research at the Accounting Standards Board right now on carbon credits because it is an emerging area of accounting and there isn't clear, it's not necessarily clear what the accounting should be. And, and, and uh, so we're doing research on that. Power purchase arrangements. The the IASB has a project ongoing related to power purchase arrangements, so we're thinking about that and how we're going to comment as uh, as Canadians and the recs related to that. They kind of they, they kind of fall into those carbon credits, even though they're like kind of the opposite of they're a little bit different than the carbon credits, but it, it all it all they're all somewhat related. And the thing that I've been thinking about recently that I'm probably wasn't thinking about a year ago. Uh, from an accounting standpoint, because I was thinking about this, I was probably knew about these things a year ago, is, is net zero commitments. And and I think it's it's interesting that Chris, what Chris and Fiona brought up is because how companies um, are potentially going to achieve net zero commitments is through the use of carbon credits uh, and the, the use of, of uh, power purchase arrangements. And uh, the, the reason this is a, is a current topic yeah, that I've been thinking about uh, quite a bit lately is the IFRS Interpretations Committee recent, re recently uh, received a submission uh, related to a company that made a net zero commitment. And the question that was asked, well, they've made this commitment. They've, they've, they've stated they're going to do this. Well, there's obviously a cost to, to making that net zero commitment. And does that create a liability? Uh, which was an interesting question. And you know the the interpretations committee. What what they do is they look at the fact pattern submitted and say, well, is the standard is there, is there clear guidance on this or or not within the standards? And and they they outlined they looked at the fact pattern outlined. Well, in that fact pattern, there actually isn't uh, a liability to be recognized. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. You can you can read all about it for you know if you're if you're a real accounting nerd, you probably already know about it because you follow what the IFRIC does like I do. Um, but if you're not an accounting nerd, you can look these things up, you can look these things up and it's a really interesting one. But, but why I think this is important is regardless of what they concluded, whether there was a liability or not, the fact is that companies have to think about these sustainability issues. They have to think about these risks, these opportunities, the statements they're making, and, and does that create um, uh, any changes to their financial reporting? And even if you're not recording liability, when you're making these commitments, uh, they are potentially impacting future cash flows. And, and if it's impacting future cash flows, that potentially has other financial reporting implications, such as impairment or or other things so so the fact that we're you know all these things that are happening out there and and you know kind of the the, the whole sustainability world and the the, the emergence of sustainability reporting that impacts fine yeah you know, the fact that we have to think about that from a financial statement standpoint is something that i that i've been spending a lot of time thinking about for the the past year Definitely. And really interesting to see those connectivity issues and how it impacts everyone. Uh, but continuing with you, Armin, you know, you're a standard setter. How, and you know, we, we've mentioned a few emerging issues that, you know, cause everyone to reflect and think about standards. But how do you write standards to ensure that all these emerging issues are kind of dealt with or that they'll be applicable in the future, you know? Yeah, yeah that's, uh, so I'm going to talk about, you know, the perfect world that I wish I lived in. Uh, and in, in the perfect world, as a standard setter, um, I wouldn't necessarily have to think about emerging issues whatsoever because we would write principle-based standards uh, and we would apply professional judgment and the the application of, prof of professional judgment within principle-based frameworks really sh uh, should result in what I will call a future-proofed standard that can handle any new type of transaction, asset class, or any new issue that arises. So that's that's in, in a perfect world, you know, we would have these principles and never have to think about emerging issues because the standards would be future-proofed. Um, but, you know, as we all know, uh, we, we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, our standards, which are principle-based, uh, have rules embedded in them. There's no, there's no pure principle-based standards. There's, there's always going to be some rules embedded in them. And the other 
The other issue is applying professional judgment is really, really hard. And it's, and it's, it's even harder when you have um, people evaluating those judgments you've made with hindsight, right? You're making a judgment, uh, you know, and, and you're, you're making it based on facts and circumstances. And then you, you might have a, you know, uh, someone, you know, a, a regulator, uh, a, you know, something goes wrong, you know, a, a lawyer looking over your shoulder and saying, well, that I don't really know about that judgment, but it's easy to po poke a hole in that judgment when, you know, time has passed and you have hindsight. So, so as a standard setter, when I, when I think about that um, and, you know, how hard the judgment is and the fact that we, we, we don't have pure principle-based standards, you know, my focus is really how can I keep the standards as principled as possible, knowing full well that's there's always going to be some rules embedded in there. And that when we're writing the standards, we've given enough guidance that allows someone preparing the, you know, preparing the financial statements to know when and how to apply that professional judgment. Um, and then also think about the disclosures because the application of professional judgment will result in some diversity so that there's disclosure on how those judgments are made such that a person like Chris can then, you know, look at the disclosures and, and understand well, yeah, there's some diversity in the debits and credits, but in the combination with the disclosure, I'm getting the information I need to be able to compare uh, two different companies. Thanks, Fiona. I saw you nodding when Armin was speaking earlier. Uh, if I stay on the topic of professional judgment, uh, as a preparer, do you feel you, that you actually have the ability or the freedom to apply some professional judgment when you have to account for emerging issues? Well, it's not always easy. And and to Armand's point about, you know, the regulators, you know, the CRTC, which governs the telecom industry, has their own view of what's an affiliate, which may not always align with what the accountant's view is. But on top of that, it's, you know, it is exercising your professional judgment, but you have to ensure that the key thing is you consider consistency within your industry. And you work with your auditors as ultimately they need to be uh, comfortable with your professional judgment. In the VPPA example above that I provided, the, the standards are still catching up on this particular subject. Um, and even though there are, there are principle-based rules, they don't always work for these emerging transactions, as you mentioned there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the key is your professional network. It's key for these scenarios. I reached out to my network and I talked to a lot of peers in other industries and I made new contract contacts throughout the process. And the one thing to remember is your, your professional network isn't, it contains non-accountants that can actually introduce you to an accountant. And I, I actually utilize that because unfortunately, when it's an emerging issue, AI, chat, GBT, and, and Google, they're not going to be helpful because the answer is just not there yet. Um, it's not available. But, um, you know, we, we compared arrangements, uh, talked to a lot of people, talked to different accounting firms even, uh, and we ensured the arrangements were similar. We discussed the accounting under the current rules. And, and ultimately, we came to the same conclusion. And that just ensured consistency, not only within industry, but across industry and, and really within Canada, because VPPAs are a bit unique in Canada where we, we manage our electricity grid. So there are certain nuances by country, even when you have uh, rules or, or principles based. Thanks. So I know that the wish for consistency and comparability in your in your point there. Uh, before I jump to the next question, I just want to remind the audience that we will have a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. So if you do have questions for the panelists, please type them in the Q&A box that you can see on your screen. Um, so Chris, you do rely a lot on the financial statements in your work. Um, however, when the accounting is not clear and a, the same transaction or product can be represented in different ways, well, how do you analyze financial statements? Well, I, I guess so coming back to what Fiona just said, con or the consistency and comparability thing is really important and it kind of drives me nuts when it's not there. So a, a classic example is if you think about business combinations and more specifically joint ventures, it really fascinates me that you could have almost the exact same transaction and it's reported completely differently depending on where you look and the companies you look like, for example, one of my favorite company, or I'm not going to say favorite companies, but 
two companies I used to follow, they were both public companies, so both public reporting entities, decided to form a 50-50 joint venture together. And this entity's, the main activities were going to be to research and develop a new lithium ion battery that used graphene as well for new EVs that was going to have better range than every, everyone else had. And so as a user, when I start reading and I say, okay, this is going to be research and development, this is going to be a big cash burn. It's going to use a lot of cash. And so coming back to what Armand said, I want good disclosures to know, okay, how much future cash is this going to take? And this is where things get really interesting. So 50-50 joint venture on the exact same private entity, the disclosures were completely different. And so there was one sub where it just gave some basic details about it and another which went really detailed and even had a note disclosure where we were talking about the future cash commitments they anticipated for this joint venture. And I was like, this is great because now I know you're 50-50. I know the other person is probably going to have to put up as well. And so what's kind of funny is at the end of the day, the company who had their disclosures actually ended up buying back the other entity's stake in this joint venture. And so I guess looping back to what Armand said about disclosures is at the end of the day as a user, what I'm concerned with on these kind of transactions specifically is what's the cash drain or the associated future cash flows that are going to arise as a result of these transactions and give me the disclosures so I can adjust my model accordingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, Armin, yeah, and coming back to your point that you strive to issue principles-based standard, when and how do you determine that a specific issue, a new emerging issue, needs standard setting? Yeah, that's um, it's a it's a great question, and 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 I think first of all, there's before we get into standard setting, there we have other tools as well, other than standard setting. Um, you know, there's you know, sometimes it's. Um, from an IFRS standpoint in Canada, we have our IFRS accounting standards discussion group, um, which doesn't interpret IFRS, but but does have knowledgeable people talking about IFRS issues that, you know, we publish meeting notes on. So, so carbon credits, the, you know, Chris talked about the generation of them. We've talked about that, that, that issue um, at, uh, at, at the IDG. Uh, Rex that Fiona mentioned, we've talked about those at, at, at the IDG. Uh, so, so there's other tools that what I'll call kind of non-authoritative guidance, but, but are, insightful uh, for people to look at that, that can be used. They're really just outlining, you know, what the, um, you know, kind of outlining how you apply the standard, right? And just kind of walking you through the standard and, and, and what you would do for it. So, you know, kind of the first question is, is standard setting really needed or is there another tool that can be used? Um, but, you know, at the, at the end of the day, there are situations when standard setting is, is needed. Um, you know, we, you know, as much as I really want, you know, principles based standards, I want, uh, professional judgment applied, uh, what that's going to result in diversity. It's inevitable. It's going to result in diversity. So, um, that, you know, there's two important questions I'm going to ask myself, you know, or, or I think we're going to ask ourselves as a board is does that diversity that is emerging impact the decisions of users financial statements? So does it impact, you know? someone like Chris. Uh, and then even if there isn't diversity, uh, and this is something Fiona made a comment about related to PPAs, is is that is the principal providing users with relevant information? Right. So those those are the two things. It's like you know, for, as a standard setter, you know, we consider preparers, we consider auditors, but we're doing this for the users. That's who we're doing this for. That's why. That's why you, you know, people who prepare financial statements, you prepare financial statements because someone wants to use those financial statements, right? So the, you know, so th that that's that's the goal, right? Is is getting users decision useful information. So so I'm, I'm you know, masking myself. Is am I impacting decisions uh, of users? Am I giving them relevant information? And then I also have to think about the prevalence and significance of the issue because as standard setters. We only have so many hours in the day. We can't deal with every issue. So, you know, we have to prioritize them. And if it's prevalent, if it's a significant impact, we're going we're gonna to look at it. So I, I just thought I'd go through two examples of, of, of situations where the International Accounting Standards Board uh, has, has looked at. One that they've taken on uh, a project for standard setting and one where they haven't. And kind of just walk through that process. And the first one is, is PPAs that, that Fiona's brought up. So, you know, there's virtual PPAs, which 
you know, in my opinion, the accounting is very clear. They're derivatives, um, you know, and, and, and it, you know, the hedge accounting aspects of it, Fiona, I agree, hasn't caught up yet. But from the pure accounting, they're derivatives and the accounting is clear. And then there's also physical PPAs that are, are common in jurisdictions other than Canada, uh, where I also believe the accounting is clear that there are derivatives there as well. However, there is some diversity that has emerged. But, but even if we think the answer is clear, and I, and I know I think the answer is clear, but I know others don't think the answer is clear. Um, the question is, is it providing decision useful information? And some would say large swings in the P&L for fair value changes of a 30 year energy supply contract just create, it just, it's just noise and, and isn't giving decision useful information. Fiona's nodding her head. <laughs> I think she agrees with me on that one. Um, and, and, and the fact that these are common um, and becoming more prevalent because this is, especially in, in jurisdictions like Europe with the, 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 the European Green Deal, uh, even in Canada, depending on what, you know, how green your grid is, depending on where you, where you are, uh, this is how companies purchase green energy, right, is through these virtual power purchase agreements. So when the ISB looked at it, the issue is significant because the, the, the impact on the financial statements is, is, is big when these things happen, when there's fair value swings and it's prevalent and therefore they're, they're taking it on. They're, they're doing standard setting. Another issue, another area that, you know, we can call as an emerging area uh, um, that they haven't taken on is cryptocurrencies. And so, so cryptocurrencies is an interesting one. I, again, there's questions on whether the accounting is clear or not. Um, some might say it's clear and just don't like the answer because the answer is it's an intangible asset or potentially considered inventory like a broker dealer. And some people just don't like that answer because they just don't think of it as an intangible asset. Um, and, and, and this is interesting because in Canada, we have quite a few companies listed on our exchanges that operate in this space. Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, in, in Canada, some would say this is an issue that, uh, standard setting should, should take on. However, when we look at other jurisdictions, it's not common, like outside of Canada, there are very few public listed companies that are in the crypto space whatsoever. So when the ISB looked at this, they would say, well, it's not prevalent. It's it's happening in one of the 150 jurisdictions that applies IFRS. So we're not going to do anything with this. It's it's not an urgent issue for us at this point in time. Um, so there are two two different you know topics, both emerging. One where there is standard setting happening. One where there isn't standard setting happening. You kind of the the whole user information prevalence significance brought into play. And then we'll, from our domestic standpoint, when we're talking about um, you know. Uh, Parts two and part three of our handbooks or accounting standards for private enterprises or accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations, we go through a very similar process, right? Is it is it going to impact the user? Is it prevalent? Is it significant? We're going to that all those things are going to be considered when when issues when we become become aware of emerging issues. Um, and some are going to be dealt with because they meet those tests, and some you know, aren't and, and people have to apply the principles and apply professional judgment to, to come to accounting answers. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially the fact that the ISB has to consider the prevalence worldwide, whereas you as a national standard setter, you look at Canada, obviously. So, uh, well, Fiona, uh, Armin alluded to the IFRS discussion group and well, to the international developments uh, on the virtual, well, on PPAs in general. Um, do you have other means to keep up to date with uh, standard setting developments and interpretations overall? Absolutely. I think it's important to note that when the standards are issued, they're, they're issued with illustrative examples and basis of conclusions, which are helpful. Mm -hmm. But I also pay a close attention to the ISB updates, any IFRIC agenda decisions. Uh, I also pay attention to the accounting firm publications, and as Armand mentioned, the industry uh, discussion groups. And I keep in touch with my peers as well. And it, the one thing I've noticed is be careful when you're pulling stuff from Google because it's not always accurate. And you, so you got to make sure you're dealing with a reliable source. But it's it's also, um, you know, 
interesting to note that um, our man was talking about, you know, you have to consider what's useful to the end user in all of this. And that becomes very important. And, you know, to the VPPA example above and the large swings, and I, I don't believe it's very useful for the end user. So we, we take care of that through our disclosures. Uh, and we would even um, provide a, an adjusted view so that the end user has the relevant information they need for the current operations. But it really is important to get involved and stay informed. You know, you get I, I'm involved in the outreach discussions with the ISB and the ACSB. And I've got professional network comes in very handy, as I, I mentioned above. And it's really just keeping in touch, keeping in touch with everything. Thank you. And turning to you, Chris. Um, you know, well, maybe to help Fiona, uh, help her decide what to put in her financial statements, what, what kind of information you look for as a user? So in terms of information, I want data. And I kind of joke, users are going to keep asking for more and more until they get the general ledger. Um, but I think it's interesting because the reason we want the data is we can't follow every single company that's out there. When we're looking for new ideas, a lot of users will start with a screen. So they'll go onto a data aggregator, something like Bloomberg or FactSet, and they'll be searching for key criteria of companies that they like and that have proven to be successful over time, and they're screening for this. Now, where does a data aggregator get its data from? Well, if I look at Bloomberg, for example, they're going to have a team dedicated to entering in Apple's financial results because a lot of people care, and a lot of people are going to go look at it. But when I go look at the sort of Canadian small cap companies, they're going to be entered through a scrape. And back to what Fiona said about be careful about what you get off from Google, be careful what you get off from the data aggregators, because occasionally when you use a scrape, sometimes the data is going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And it could either just be misentered, it picks up the wrong data point. The other thing it might be doing is it might not be fully representing a transaction, and you might actually screen out a company because of that. So an example of something that mm -hmm. happens sort of often here in Canada is so... You have a Canadian listed company, they have a Canadian convertible debenture traded in Canadian dollars, but they use a US reporting currency. And the company starts doing well and their stock price goes up. And that's great. And sort of coming back to what Armand said about the fair value adjustments going through the PL, depending on how that gets picked up and how the data aggre aggregator uses it, you might actually screen out a company because that increase in the cost is going to hit your uh, net income. And so if I look at a return on equity or a return based metric, and I want to say, is it increasing year over year? I might actually screen out the company, but the reality is they're doing well. The data aggregator didn't pick up that transaction well enough and adjust for it. So I care about getting the data and I want it clean because I want a company to be able to tell their story to me and I can pick it up and say, well, you're doing great. I want to go buy you. That's interesting. That's a really good point about data aggregators. I'm sure preparers will be disappointed to learn that nobody really reads their notes. <laughs> you know, at least you, you don't. Uh, well, fair, fair point. You read the notes of the, the entities, the data aggregator has screened for you. Um, but to ensure, you know, that those that your points are taken on by standard setter, I'm curious to know, are users involved in the standard setting process at all? For sure. So I think I'm going to answer that question and the last one. Oh, so I, the notes are 100% important. I want to just make that really clear because I care about the screens for a starting standpoint on the idea generation because they help the user care about where do I do my deep dive? Okay, so this checks all the boxes. Time to go crack open the spine and actually read the financials and see what's going on. So we do definitely care, but the data aggregators help in terms of doing the first pass and screening out the companies that I don't want to spend time on. Now, in terms of users' views being expressed in standard setting, like Armand was saying, everything they're doing is for the users. So the users are really important. They really matter. If I look at, let's say, the ACSB, so Canada's Accounting Standards Board, the IASB, FASB in the US, they all at least have one user member on their board. And I think that's really important because, like Armand was saying, you want to know who's reading this at the end of the day. On top of that, all these boards have subcommittees as well made up of users. So if I look at Canada specifically, we have something called the UAC or the Users Advisory Council. And they're going to be asked many times throughout a project on what their thoughts are. Are the disclosures that we're going to present for ones you want? Are we missing something? Is there something we should be giving? Because Armand said it best, you're doing it for the users. So are the users happy with the standards you're creating or not? And can we make a change to make it more useful for them? Which I really appreciate. 
Well, thanks for that. Cause I, I, well, I think it's a misconception that standard setting is only done by accountants and for accountants only. So it's good to know that users are actually quite involved. Um, one last reminder to ask your questions, uh, please send them in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll move to our last question already for discussion. Um, Armin, we mentioned a few times uh, you know, that principles-based standards are important, but that can sometimes result in diversity in practice. And Chris alluded to the joint ventures example. Um, do you actually think it's an issue that we have different uh, representations of a similar transaction? Um, well, a, a couple things. Uh, first of all, a, a, a plug for Chris on the uh, on the data, and I'm going to do a little plug. You know, if if you're if you're out there, if you're if you're in the business world, uh, uh, you know, one of the things we need to do in Canada is start using XBRL. Uh, so we don't have to rely on scraping scraping financial statements. But the other thing I think is important about that is it also can tag the notes related to it, where a scrape a scrape of data can do it uh, can do that. And I think the notes are critical to deal with some of these diversity issues. And and I think you know a, a couple things on 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 diversity. Um, a, a saying that I like or that I've I've stole from someone is comparability does not equal uniformity, right? So, so we, you can have comparable financial statements without things being done exactly the same way, right? You know, at the end of the day, I always think of uh, financial statements as a communication mm -hmm. document. How it's, it's an opportunity for the company to communicate what happened to them during the year to, to users. So, you know, it's, if we want uniformity, we're talking about pure compliance and 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 form filling, and I don't think that's what we ever want financial statements to be. So, so I, I think that's an important thing. Uh, I and and because of that, I I don't think diversity is is always bad. Like it, it diversity isn't it isn't a bad thing. It's it's an inevitable thing if we want principle based standards, if we want application of professional judgment, but. You know how do we deal with that diversity? We need to still make sure that the financial statements are comparable. So we have to deal with that. You know, again, we can't have crazy diversity. Like, you know, we can't have you know one company coming to an answer of of A and the other one coming to an answer of Z. Right? We need to you know maybe hopefully you know it's A and B or you, you know um, that they're that, that they're they're close. But then we 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 um, also allow for disclosure to to tell the rest of the story so that users do have the information. Um, but you know, for me again, it all comes down to the users. And if I'm looking at diversity, and if someone's saying that diversity is leading to inappropriate capital allocation decisions, then I believe that diversity is bad, and that's when we have to step in as standard setters. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I'll ask the same question to you, Fiona. We've alluded to uh, comparability and consistency, but I don't know if you have further thoughts on diversity. Actually, I, I agree. You know, ultimately it comes down to our financial statements. They need to be consistent so that they're comparable to the end user, particularly in the same industry, but even across industries, you'll receive a lot more unwanted attention from regulators if you're accounting for the similar transaction in a very different way. Um, so it is very important to be consistent. And as we heard from Chris, even if you are uh, diversifying and putting notes in your financial statements, not everyone's going to be reading those notes. So it's very important that we get that consistency. Excellent, thank you. And Chris, I'll give you the final word on diversity since you brought that topic up. Sure, so <laughs> based on what everyone else said, diversity is a fact of life and it's gonna be extremely present in financial reporting. Like imagine if everyone presented EBITDA in the same way across industries and we wouldn't have a need for adjusted EBITDA. But when your reality is when you look at adjusted EBITDA, there's a lot of companies that actually will report adjusted EBITDA in the same sector, in the same industry, in different ways because they have different ad backs. And the way you deal with diversity is you just you make a judgment call. Is this a one-off expense that I should be giving management credit for? Or do I think this is recurring and it's going to keep coming up and it's happening? So like examples are if you have a serial acquirer who goes out and buys businesses all the time. Are those acquisition and restructuring costs one time in nature or recurring? How do I treat that? 
or a company that goes out and the company hasn't invested in CapEx or equipment needs updating, they have a problem. So they go and buy a competitor, not for operations, but because they have new equipment that's better and more efficient. And so I'm going to go buy them not as an acquisition, but because I didn't make enough CapEx investments or enough investments in CapEx, how do I adjust for that? And it's important as a user. And for me, it's sort of coming back to what I said before, as a user, I want to make sure I get the information necessary to be able to make that judgment call. And so I think that's something standard setters are very attuned to. So one thing I like in the upcoming IFRS 18 is there's a focus on the requirements for aggregation and to me, more importantly, disaggregation of information. So there's nothing that drives me more nuts when I'm reading through financial statements and I'll see this line called other, and it's a huge number. I'm like, give me some meat and potatoes here. There's something here. Tell me what's going on. So I think standard setters are attuned to that. They understand it. And I like that. And in Canada, we've been doing a lot of great efforts to that. So if you're going to present a non-GAAP metric, it has to be reconciled back to a GAAP metric. And that's useful for a user. So I can see, okay, how did you get there? What were you adding in? And what were you taking out? And it helps me make that judgment call. So I know what to, how I want to deal with that diversity. It's by me making that judgment call and give me the information so I can do it. Thank you. And for a point about that very large other line, I think a lot of entities are a culprit of uh, doing that. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. There's a lot to dig into here. Um, we have received a lot of questions already, so uh, we will move to the Q&A uh, part of the session. Uh, maybe a first one for Armin, because we uh, we talked about the IFRS discussion group. Um, so uh, this uh, audience member is asking if the IFRS discussion group discuss issues that are prevalent in Canada, but not worldwide, such as the cryptocurrency uh, issue you mentioned. Um, yes, uh, I, I think that, you know, when, again, when we think about our tools in Canada, like so, so a couple of things we as a policy, you know, we apply, you know, for most Canada's IFRS is issued by the ISV. So that means we do not interpret. But like I said, the IFRS discussion group talks about these issues. People, you know, there's preparers, there's users, there's auditors, uh, there's academics on on the the uh, the IDG. And, and they, they talk about these issues. So we have had conversations on crypto. We had a really good discussion uh, probably a little over a year ago on crypto lending. And crypto lending was a was a pretty important topic, um, you know, in 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 you know, you know, in the the in after FTX, there was a number of companies that actually went bankrupt in Canada because they were lending, uh, they were lending crypto to to FTX, and and so that it was it became a hot issue. Uh, our hot topic. So, the, so that was the crypto lending uh, topic is, is is a great example of of us talking about an issue that is important in Canada, but maybe not as important worldwide. Thanks for that. Uh, a question maybe for Fiona as a practicing CPA, and you know you have to apply professional judgment yourself. So how? Do you think we should train accounting students or junior accounting professionals to, you know, to first navigate in a dynamic environment where things change uh, and emerging issues arise and eventually apply the professional judgment in, in that environment? You know, it's it's very important, I think, to have a mentor relationship for someone who has the experience, because a lot of this comes with experience. And and I am privileged to be a part of that program. It uh, helps you to build the skills, uh, earn the um, knowledge, because it's one of those things that you you learn over over time. No one is going to know absolutely everything. Our men might come close, but no one will actually know everything. And so you're going to need to learn how to do your research, how to work with your professional peers, and how to um, document things such that you have a, a, a something to go back to so that you know. Maybe it's a similar scenario that you looked at two years ago, and you can go back and say, okay, the standards haven't changed. This is a similar kind of scenario. This is what we said last time. And then it helps you actually be consistent, not only across industry, but also within your own financial statements. Thank you for that. 
Um, hmm. I, I guess I'll ask Chris for that one, although it could be Armin. Uh, do you think the international convergence in standard setting helps or impedes mm -hmm. change uh, when it comes to address to addressing emerging issues? We might have you go first, Chris. I, I was gonna say I think it definitely helps because it helps increase the comparability, which is important, and I care about a lot. And I'd love to see international alignment on many issues because it would make my life easier. It doesn't have to be. But it gets frustrating when you can look at two companies in the exact same industry, but one's in Canada and one's maybe south of the border from here. And the results are almost not comparable because of how they record different transactions. It's like, you're the same company, you operate the same way, it's almost the same end user, and I can't compare you guys. It gets frustrating, and I'd love to see more international alignment, but I also understand, like when you were talking about before, there's a set of centers that's meant for the whole world, not just one country, uh, one country right? So... There's give and take. I would love alignment. I would love comparability because it would help me on my decision-making process and understanding more industry dynamics. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think comparability, like at, at the end of the day, I think, you know, we, a, a couple of things, you know, first of all, we, we apply IFRS for publicly accountable enterprise in Canada. We have our own domestic standards for, for private enterprises. When we talk about publicly accountable you know, primary, you know, financial institutions, the listed companies in there, all operate in global markets. And therefore, globally comparable standards is is helpful. I, I, I think it allows for for better movement of capital, for for all of those things. It's it's it, it it's 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 important. Um and I think you know Chris, you said the give and take, you know, that just means to a certain extent international accounting standards is a bit of there's a bit of give and take, right? We might want some things in Canada in the standard, but we might not get everything we want. But that giving up, we might not get everything we want, but we are still getting global comparability, which is which is important. Um, I think you know Chris mentioned south of the border, so you know basically there's two. There's from a capital market standpoint, you have IFRS, um, which is pretty much everywhere except for the U.S. But U.S. GAAP is also everywhere because everywhere has cross-listed entities. And I think one of the – we often uh, uh, joke around at the Accounting Standards Board that, uh, you know, Canada, you know, we're, we're, we're a bilingual nation. Uh, and, 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 you know, beyond, our, beyond language uh, in, in that we speak both IFRS and, and, and U.S. GAAP, right, because of the proximity. So what, one of the roles we – take very seriously uh, when we're at meetings internationally is 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 raising issues where well there is some divergence from us gap here and is that you know and although the and, and you can have different words and you can have like different uh, different requirements as long as the outcomes are similar but there are areas and you know I know one related to leases Chris that you're passionate about where the outcomes are not similar mm -hmm. and and that impacts users so i think you know i think that's you know that's hard to deal with um but i but i do think you know at, at the same time it does slow things down you know when when you're doing things internationally we when we issue an exposure draft in canada on our domestic standards if we get 20 response letters we're ecstatic like wow we've got a lot of things to consider the ISB gets hundreds of response letters for everything. They're hearing from hundreds, you know, hundreds of countries. So it, it's just going to that that's just going to take that much longer for them to go through their due, due process because of that. Thank you. And Armin, not to put you on the spot, but to continue on that, uh, well, the fact that some issue might be prevalent in a country, but not internationally. Um, somebody from the audience is wondering if the ACSB will eventually provide either guidance or a standard on cryptocurrency, uh, even if the ISP is not doing anything? Um, again, like we're, we, you know, again, we, we don't want to interpret IFRS. Um, you know, we, we do, we, you know, by no means do we rubber stamp IFRS. We have an endorsement process uh, before any, we have to vote as a board before anything ends up in our handbook. Um, but it would be a very high bar for us to deviate from IFRS as issued by the IASB because we, again, we want that global comparability. Um, we, you know, 
and, and that involves not interpreting. So we will use the tools like our IFRS discussion group to have discussions on that. But you know, as far as us issuing a standard on, on cryptocurrencies for publicly accountable, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, if, if something like crypto becomes prevalent in our private company space, that's a different discussion on whether we would need to do a standard setting for private companies. So far, when we've talked to our, we have an advisory committee or a private enterprise advisory committee. Um, we've asked them a number of times is, is, are you seeing this in, in companies in entities applying our part two of our handbook? And they said, no. Um, but that may change in the future and we may need to do something there domestically um, in, in that case. Excellent, thank you. So we'll have to keep uh, listening and keep ourselves up to date with standard setting. Um, Fiona, I have a very practical question for you. Um, do you have any suggestions to help reduce the efforts in preparing financial statements as standards, you know, they grow, they change, the business activities uh, get more complex? You know, well, the automation wherever possible, but, you know, mm -hmm. just being consistent in your um, professional judgment, consistent in your financial statements as well because ultimately it becomes an updating exercise versus a recreating exercise all over again. It's still a significant amount of effort. You have to make sure you have everything covered when you're doing your financial statements, and particularly to the notes that I'm not going to think about Chris saying that he doesn't read them, but, uh, and I know I joke there, but, but it is important. And consistency, even in the notes, is important. You don't want to be changing the format or what you're saying as long as the contact is similar. Hope that helps. So automation and consistency, I get that. Thank you. And Chris, uh, maybe a thought-provoking question for you. You know, as a user, you want more data. You you, you mentioned you would like to have access to the the ledgers uh, if if it was possible. But you know, there's a there's obviously a cost involved in providing more uh, data, especially if that uh, those financial statements are audited. So can you explain the link between you know the cost of providing more data and maybe the reduction in the cost of capital for the entity or in other words, will there be event advantages for the entity producing that data? For sure. And that's a really interesting question. I saw it in the chat and I was like, oh, that's a really <laughs> great question. Um, it, it, at the end of the day, how does that extra data help you tell me your story, right? Because I have to find the company. I have to go out. If you give me the data to be able to find you, it's going to help me say, okay, here's the reason why I want to purchase you because of X, Y, Z. So yes, there's going to be a cost of producing more and more data, right? That's very apparent. But if that data helps tell your story, it helps explain, okay, this is why revenue came off. Was it because there was a stop of the contract? We sold off a division, like what happened? What's going on? The more of the data helps tell your story. And from a standpoint of, okay, this is great. Yes, I would want to buy your stock, buy whatever dementia you're offering, it's going to help you reduce that cost of capital, right? So there's going to be, I don't know if there's an exact science between the trade-off between how much more it's going to cost and how much it's going to reduce, but the more you can put out data that helps tell your story, the more interested I'm going to be, the more interested I'm going to be actually reading for notes saying, hang on, well, when I look at this, I go down to your note 32. Yeah, that does actually make sense. So hang on, the story keeps going. And like, at least in that case, you're keeping me there. You're telling me your story. And that way, if I ever do have to go ask management a question, I know a lot more of the story and you're telling me a lot more and I can make that capital allocation decision a lot better. And, and Chris, just to build on that, because this the whole cost benefit uh, issue is one we talk about a lot at the board. And, uh, and when we talk to our, we have, have an academic advisor, we have an academic on our board and we have an academic advisory committee as well. And uh, our, our academic on the board will always point to academic research that more information also lowers cost for, for the companies. And I, and I think that's really important because I think sometimes we think about it as the benefit all goes to the users and the cost is all borne by the preparer. And, and yes, the, there is some of that. However, you know, more information reduces risk for Chris which if it reduces his risk, reduces his his re required return, which should re reduce the cost of capital to, to a company. So there's a lot of academic studies out there that prove this point. 
that more information does reduce the cost of capital to companies. So I think when we talk about the cost benefit and we think about the benefit, it's not just for the investor making better decisions. There, there is also a benefit to the company uh, related to cost of capital. And to continue on the topic of academic research, Armin, uh, what what academic research or further academic studies could help improve uh, standard setting in general? Um, academics, one, it's one of, we, again, we have our academic advisory committee. Uh, we're always trying to engage with academics. Um, I think one of the challenges with, with academic research is depending on the type of research uh, that's done. If it's archival, it's kind of looking backwards. Um, and, and we're often looking forward on what changes we have to make to standards. Um, so, so a couple of things. So IFRS 16 recently issued, I, IFRS 17 for it, and the insurance industry just issued, uh, the, the ISB has a process of doing their post-implementation review. So research after a standard is issued, but before the ISB does its, its, um, its, its post-implementation review is very helpful for us in then uh, talking to the ISB about what the impact of that standard is and did it achieve what it was expected to achieve, right? And especially its impact on users, right? I, I, think, it, I think is important. Uh, as far as forward-looking, I know we're trying to do more with academics who do, uh, uh, yeah, Dominique, you're gonna correct me when I get these yeah. terminology okay. wrong. Field-based research, like less, yeah. less non -arch Non-archival um, um, type of research you know, interviews, surveys, experimentation, uh, because in the private company space, um, you know, we, Canada is a jurisdiction where, you know, in places like the UK, every company has to file their statement. So you can look at any company's financial statements in the UK. In Canada, that's not the case. So when we're, when we're doing standard setting from a private company standpoint, we we're kind of operating in the dark a little bit because we don't actually get to see what's happening. We, we hear about it. We don't get to see it. Um, so in the private company space, you know, any academics that are interested in, in doing kind of that less traditional type of research, uh, could be very helpful for us, um, on, on, on directing kind of where changes are needed. Well, thank you all. Um, Bertrand, I think this is all the time we had for the Q and A and thank you all for your collaboration and participation. It's been very interesting. Thank you, Dominique. So yes, we're almost running out of time. So before concluding, I'd like to thank our panelists and moderator for their insights. This has been an extremely instructive conversation. As someone put it in the chat box, thanks for making reporting an interesting topic. <laughs> it's a challenge, I have to say, but I think you, you've done that great. Um, so I hope it will inspire all of us to reflect and engage more with uh, standard setting processes. Um, I would also like to let you know of our next uh, Smith Business Insight webinar on problem solving with design thinking um, on May 8th. So if you're looking for new ways to develop products or services for customers or create smarter internal processes for your company or teams, this webinar um, can help. Uh, so that's it for us. Thank you again so much, Chris, Fiona, and Armand for your fantastic insights today. And thank you, Dominic, for being such an excellent moderator. From Smith School of Business at Queen's University, thank you to everyone for tuning